I mean, so as you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics declared a mental health emergency back in October of 2021. I mean, seven months later, there are ongoing mental health concerns, just like you said, Dr. Shriver. Uh, as a behavioral pediatrician in my practice, I am seeing so much more uh, anxiety, depression, attentional issues, but the severity has mm -hmm. gone up as well. I'm having to call my colleagues, child pe uh, psychiatrists, almost daily to talk through complex cases um, just because it has been uh, a tough, you know, time for lots of people. This just fills my cup because I think we all went in with the idea of prevention and I love how it's come full circle, that there are things, actionable steps that we each can all take um, and it's okay to not be okay. It's, we should get curious and we should put that phone down. I know that sometimes parents feel really paralyzed, but you know, at, at, the, at the end of the day, putting that phone down and just reaching for your child you know, and connecting with them. Take care of yourself and remembering there's nothing, um, there's no such thing as a perfect parent um, and just, you know, give yourself grace. Um, we've all, we're all giving each other a prescription of self-care. That's what we've got to do and find your person you can slime with, right? Um, and, and make sure you ask them permission first. three types of abuse, physical, uh, emotional, and sexual abuse, two types of neglect, physical and uh, emotional neglect, and five measures of household dysfunction, um, uh, parental substance abuse, parental mental illness, intimate partner violence, an incarcerated family member, or separation or divorce. And so they came up with an ACE score. So you got a one point for each one of those different categories. Um, and what they found was the higher your ACE score, the higher the risk for a wide array of poor outcomes down the line. Um, not only mental health issues like depression and suicide, but also smoking, substance abuse, uh, cancer, heart disease, and even early death. And so the original ACE study really forced the medical community um, to start thinking about how early experiences might be biologically embedded um, and influence outcomes in health and education and economic productivity sort of decades down the line. But there are three really important caveats. I hate talking about the ACE study because everyone in their heads adding their ACE score and they're like, oh, I'm doomed, right? And so three important caveats. One is that um, uh, it's not, ACE scores are not destiny, right? It is true that ACEs increase the probability of poor outcomes at the population level, but they're not as predictive at the individual level because there are other factors involved as well, in particular protective factors. Um, the other thing is that there are other kinds of ACEs, right? So it's not just those 10. We know there are other types of adversity like exposure to racism and poverty and just social isolation. And so um, some experts have said, Dr. Ellis in particular has said that we should think about a pair of ACEs. There's adverse childhood experiences and adverse community experiences. And then um, the, the, the final caveat is that that's only half the equation, right? Because we know that um, positive childhood experiences with safe, stable, and nurturing relationships um, they are also biologically embedded and they increase the probability of positive outcomes in health, education, and economic productivity down the line. I know we're all excited about this one, but yeah, we're all really to help people. But I want to uh, go back to the protective factors and kind of clarify too. So the literature with evidence supports those seven but I would encourage any family to kind of examine the strengths they have that may not be proven yet. Um, and, and there's some studies going on right now where we're kind of scoping out what, how many are there, what are there, what makes a protective factor, right? But I think parents um, often have a great instinct for that. And, and RJ, I love how you talk to parents about like, what do you do? And, because you know, parents have a toolbox and sometimes they just need to remember that or have confidence in it to, to draw upon it at, at tough moments, right? So just throwing that out there. First thing, you know, we asked parents um, along with, you know, their trauma experiences, what were they most interested in getting in terms of support? And by and large, you know, they asked for parenting classes and they asked for parent support groups, but they also asked for more information about trauma and what that can do. 
Um, so I think that the, the, the first tip is ask the family what they want, right? Mm -hmm. What is it that they think would be helpful that they need? Second tip, it's usually not mental health, <laughs> right? They usually don't need a mental health provider. They usually need some supports and some scaffolding um, for their parenting skills. And so those are the things that we usually turn to in terms of, of, of what we offer them. I think the third thing, just to kind of pick apart at the question a little bit, there's going to be a difference between did not experience safe and nurturing relationships and do not experience safe and nurturing relationships. So I'm super interested in who's in their life now and yeah. who's supporting them now. Um, and if you have that, that's great, right? So we go through this exercise with some of our families. It's about circles of support. And if you think about like drawing um, a target, so you have an inner circle, a secondary circle, and a tertiary circle. And the inner circle are like, who are the people in your life that you can call at two in the morning no matter what, and they're gonna have your back and they're gonna answer your questions and they're there to support you. The second circle is um, you know, the people who you might know more casually that you kind of would ask them questions some other time during the week, like, hey, I'm having a rough time, you know, can we go get coffee or whatever? Um, and then the tertiary circle are the people who are meant to kind of put guardrails on your life, as I put it. So that's like your pediatrician and, you know, maybe your, your priest or your religious leader or a mental health provider, or people like that who are there to kind of, you know, contain all of that. And, and so for the people that don't have anybody in their inner circle, that's the one that you worry about, right? Like the people that don't have any relationships now, in which case we do a process called a secondary circle push, where we just invite them to ask somebody in their second circle to come into their first circle. Um, and, and, you know, in all the times that my psychology colleagues have done this kind of thing, they've never had a, a person in a secondary circle say, no, I'm not going to do that for you. You know what I mean? That's not human nature. They're going to support you if you ask for it. But I think helping families to get the courage to, to ask for that support is really the, the, the kind of key thing. So again, to me, that's the sort of third thing is, is, is not so much did you have safe and, and, and nurturing relationships, it's do you have them now? And if not, then how do we sort of buffer that? And I think a lot of parent support groups will eventually form some of those sort of relationships if you're really um, stuck for finding somebody in their in, in their life. Um, so that to me is, is you know, first ask, <laughs> um, then, um, you know, figure out what, what um, parenting supports you can give them. And then third, you know, kind of figure out who's in their life right now that can kind of help support them through through their parenting experience. How can I effectively do this in a in a really easy and strengths based way? And how can I teach others to do it as well? So one thing that I have done in my clinic is borrowed upon the wisdom of all of you in this room and some others, and I've made um uh, I've made kind of a it's it's based off of a five two one zero, which is our healthy habits discussion. But this is called CC one two three, and this is talking about um parenting during adversity and and um, resilience. So the first C is like connections, right? And you guys all know how good it feels. Like even just being in this room with all of you, I feel so connected. It's really like jazzing me up. <laughs> um, and then coping, it gives you a two second chance to just discuss what parents need for coping. And I love asking parents, what do you need when you're stressed out? I did that yesterday. And one of the moms was like, well, I, I, I don't know. And I'm like, well, what about like, would you like it if your child helped you in the house? Would that help you when you're stressed out? And she was like, yeah. Would you like it if you got some hugs from your child? She's like, yeah. I mean, sometimes people know. Sometimes people have never had anyone ask them that. And of course, we know what children need for coping, especially during times like pandemics, is that they need routines. They need the positive rituals that you guys have all talked about that help make your life feel better and happier and more joyful. Um, and then the one, two, three part is really simple. It's take one moment to stop and reflect on what your child is trying to communicate to you, whether it's via their words or via their actions or via their tantrums or whatever it is. Just like, what are they actually saying to you? Why are they doing that? Just be reflective upon them. Don't be reactive. And then the two is two eyes for seeing and two arms for holding. Like we need to feel seen and acknowledged and uh, we need that attunement and then we need the physical affection often not everyone and i'm sure our child abuse experts in the room can tell you that some people don't really enjoy that but but those who do really need it and it's okay to ask for that and that goes for parents i ask for it 
And then three, um, I ask the families to be reflective and say, what are three ways you can show your other loved one that you love them? What are three ways that you can do it? And sometimes if the kid's old enough, I'll ask them and then I'll ask the parent. And then we just get into the conversation of like, how do we be there for each other during times of stress? And it's just an easy way for any pediatrician or family practice or whoever to acknowledge that life is full of stress, whether it's you know, super adverse, like, you know, deaths and mental health illness and whatever, or just like the everyday stress that we experience. And, and that we can just use the CC123 to do that check in um, to see where everyone is. And it has been very well received, because as you said, people are very, very in tune to stress right now. And they do want to feel acknowledged and seen. that stress is on everyone's mind, but in no one's medical chart. Um, and I think about that a lot as providers, as patients, as people, we, we know just intuitively that stress physiologically disrupts our physical and mental health. Um, but right now there seems to be a little bit of a, a chasm or like a black hole, right? If, if we see people with chronic headaches or stomach aches or pain, um, they're often told it's not medical, right? But but we actually know that prolonged activation of the stress response can lead to disruptions in our neurologic endocrine metabolic immune pathways, right? This includes pain pathways, reward pathways, chemical signals to our gut and our digestion system that could affect obesity, right, and heart disease and, um, and all these functional uh, syndromes. Um, I've really been spending a lot of time working on what do we do when the connection's not happening? Like, what do we do when the kid comes home and says, mom, I'm terrified something bad's going to happen to me at school. And the mom's like, nothing's going to happen. You're fine. Everything's fine because mom can't process it because mom's stressed. So it's been really lovely. And I find myself spending a lot of time working on the two, um, two of those PCEs, the being able to talk about feelings with your family and feeling supported by your family when you're going through a hard time. So COVID is a perfect time for that. And I noticed too that a lot of times what gets in the way of talking about the feelings is not that there's not the love or the connection, but that one person's feelings, often the child show up as behaviors, which then bring up big feelings for the parents. And then the parents are in their other space and they're like, they're like, done. You know, they just can't deal anymore. So they're frustrated. They're already dealing with extraordinary amounts of stress. So working on teaching parents coping skills and the kids coping skills, and we kind of do the same thing for everybody. We do mindfulness, meditation, um, just really simple, basic self-care skills. So when things aren't going well, pause for a second, take care of yourself, five big deep breaths. Uh, I do a toes to nose mindfulness thing where I have them start with their toes and go up their body to their head and just check in with your body and ground yourself in your body. Um, and it can really help to just allow families to access those PCEs when things are hard. It, or that you're talking about between parent and child or between primary care physician and child is also work that we do encourage the caregivers between parent and parent between from peer to peer mm -hmm. and and that is so powerful as well and it's something that every single one of us can do in our lives um, that we can um, find our people right we can tell our story in a way that feels um, safe and protected to people that we trust we can um, practice mindfulness we can learn about it we can be um, self-compassionate and um, accepting of our foibles right that we're not perfect um, so and and also you mentioned about finding joys and and um, recognizing your own strengths that's another thing that we really focus on and also uh, important to resilience and that we can do for one another. You know, when one of us is low on hope, you know, we can be a hope giver to someone else and recognize strengths in other people. Um, finding, we talk a lot about to uh, finding micro joys and micro moments. If you don't, if you can't find like the big joys and big moments right now in your life, um, appreciating the micro joys and micro moments, the little things that get you jazzed up, the, you know, taste of the first sip of your coffee in the morning, the um, the, the child sitting on your lap, you know, mm -hmm. the, those moments that um, 
all are part, important to our resilience and that we can support one another in doing so. So I think it's also important to look at this not only as parent to child or physician to child, but also peer to peer. Yeah. I, if you love this, thank you so much. Share this episode. It's on uh, the replay is media available as soon as I end this broadcast. It's also on my YouTube channel. Share it, share it widely. Let's keep talking. And as a reminder, um, you know, please reach out to me. Uh, contact me at Dr. Narissa at Let's Talk Kids Health.org. Follow me on any of these platforms and message me if you have a topic or guest or you want to come on the show. Let me know. Let's chat, okay? It was so, so good. I think you'll all agree. So thanks again, and we'll talk again soon.